Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Nathan, to give me the, to, uh, the opportunity to speak about my research. And today I will speak about this work that I've been doing. So one of them, the first paper you see, it's uh, an essay that we have written with Daniel Grumila and um, Shaheen Sheikh Jabari. And the main content, it's from a paper that appeared um, last month that has been doing in collaboration with uh, Hamad Hadami, Faid uh, Taliou and Hossein Yavatarno. So I have on purpose decided to, the talk will be I think less than one hour for sure, so to be able to have as many discussions as we want to have, so don't hesitate to interrupt me to ask questions if something is not clear and I hope to present to convey the main point of our work. So, the main goal that we have is to determine the phase space of gravitational system with boundaries. Why is it important to, to be able to describe gravitational uh, space time with boundaries? It's because it's happening all the time. So here I give you some example of boundaries. So for example, uh, if you consider asymptotically flat space time, they have this uh, surface that is called future null infinity that I have uh, that is uh, displayed by this uh, curly J that we call Scry plus. Another example of boundary that can be very nice to describe, it's the causal boundary. And by them, I have in mind the horizon of the black holes. That is kind of a boundary in the space time because it's, it's separated to disconnected, uh, to disconnected causally, uh, to disconnected region. And, um, and so why is it important? All of that um, boundary description is, but one of the main motivation is the holographic dualities where you, um, it's conjectured that the bulk dynamic, everything is happening in the bulk is encoded in the boundary. So that's where the boundary enters. Uh, also when you want, for example, to tackle the entropy problem, so to find whose microstates are responsible for the very large entropy of black holes. You might want to see what is happening, for example, on the horizon of the black hole, uh, which can be encoded there or at infinity in the spirit of a holographic duality. You also might want to describe if uh, you have some matter falling in the black hole, where the information goes, maybe on the horizon of the black hole. So that's also a, a good point. You have also this very nice uh, physical effect as uh, the gravitational memory effects, for example, would explain at infinity. So what we want to do more precisely is to figure out what is the phase space. And so a phase space here, what I mean by that is an ensemble of states such that they belong to the, a structure that is defined on the boundary. So we will give you a structure uh, in another world, what is the behavior of the field near the boundary? And also, I will need to tell you there are solution of which theory, so I need to tell you what is the dynamics of my states. So, we want to describe this phase space for gravity theory with a boundary, and so how we can organize those states in our theory, it will be by considering the symmetry group will preserve this boundary. What does that mean by that is like, because you add a boundary to your space-time structure, it means that not all diffeomorphism will still be symmetry. It, uh, the presence of the boundary will break the full diffeomorphism variant that you have in your theory. So some of them will be forbidden. And after the one who preserved the boundary, you, will, you can have two time of those. The first time will be really pure gauge, so they really have no effect when you act with that symmetry on the state. And some of them actually we, we have, will have an effect and those now are not anymore pure gauge, but they become physical. I will describe more later in the talk all the details about the definition we associated with those concepts. And us, we have decided to study the phase space when the boundary is a null hypersurface and of codimension one uh, null hypersurface. So what we'll do, first of all, I will give um, a counting argument about how many states we expect to find in the phase space. And after I will develop a bit the general strategy that 
we want to perform in this work and in following work that will come in the future. And after to illustrate my, the, this program, I will work on the three-dimensional Einstein gravity and also on the two-dimensional Einstein dilaton gravity. And I will motivate why I choose those two theory. And finally, I will conclude and discuss a bit the results we are gonna have. So the phase is what we expect. So we have a theory, uh, gravity theory in D dimension with a boundary. So that theory is described in terms of a metric that is a D uh, symmetric two tensor. So its number of component, it's D, D plus one over two. And out of them, what do you, you have? First, you have D dimension that you can use D component of uh, that metric can be used to gauge your metric uh, deciding how your metric behave outside the boundary. So you don't touch at the boundary structure, you look what is happening in the bulk. You have also D, D minus three over two component that correspond to the propagating, propagating graviton so that we know that in a theory, in gravity theory, you can have that much of uh, uh, propagating degrees of freedom. And here I will use all the world propagating, all the world, the world bulk degrees of freedom. And uh, finally, if you make the counting, you see that you are last with Z component, and those will be associated to what is called, what we call the boundary degrees of freedom. So they are the, um, they are due to the residual gauge symmetry that I was talking about that will act non-trivially on the boundary. And in full generality, those will just depend on the coordinates of, on that boundary, which is co-dimension one functions that we are uh, expecting. And just something that is important is that if you choose your gauge or your boundary condition or your structure in the boundary in a bad way, you might uh, spoil the appearance of some of the degrees of freedom. For example, if you don't allow certain, uh, um, cert I mean, if you start, you say your boundary structure has to have, uh, the first time is R to 27, you will, you will lead to some unphysical physics in your, um, in your phase space. And so you have to be careful about what you allow or not. And it's, uh, yeah, that's the game we want to play. So what is the program? Our goal was this to, study, to make a systematic treatment of the boundary degrees of freedom and also how they might interact with the bulk degrees, the bulk degrees of freedom that I was talking about. And the first question we might ask is like, how do you realize this maximal number of boundary conditions? I want to give you some realization where I will explicitly switch on all of those boundary degrees of freedom. After the following question will be, what do they represent? What is the physics uh, behind them? And also obviously how they interact with the bulk degrees of freedom. It's a very ambitious program. And so in this talk, I will just uh, consider the first, the point one of that uh, program. And a good strategy to deal with that question is to switch off the bulk degrees of freedom, to just consider only the boundary so you have no, um, no noise for the bulk degrees of freedom and you're really just talking about the boundary one. And so we need a toy model in which we have only boundary degrees of freedom and that is given by, for example, by three-dimensional Einstein gravity. Because it's simple, you don't have graviton, but yet it's non-trivial. It has been shown that you have solution with killing horizons, you have black holes. So it's uh, very rich on the physics that you can describe in that setup. So 3D gravity, um, I want to find the maximal phase space content. And what I, I, I am expecting is that I want to find three co-dimension one function in my phase space, three uh, boundary degrees of freedom. So let's start. So I will choose some coordinates. First, I will put my null hypersurface at R equal to zero. That's the surface here. And here is the direction towards the bulk. So it's R bigger than zero. And the, I will define advanced time V that will run along this null hypersurface and the transverse direction to my screen 
will be phi and that will be taken to be to pi periodic. <laughs> no. So, so the, um, the boundary structure that I choose is the following. So you can see that um, the eta here is only depending on v and phi, while all these three functions, big F, small f, and h, are some um, function of all the coordinates, and we choose that expansion. Now, I was telling you that we, were, we have to look about the symmetry of preserving that structure that we have put on our boundary. What does it mean mathematically? It means that we look some, to some uh, vector such that the, a point of your phase space, so G is a point of your phase space, plus a perturbation around it under this, um, this vector, and here is the lead derivative, I still, uh, I mean, needs to belong to the same structure that we start with. And if you solve that, asking that this guy fall in the structure that I have given to, I have gave to you, you realize that that are the component of your of your, of your symmetry generator. So what do we have? We have this, uh, the V component, it's depending on this T, that it's just a function of V and phi. And so this guy represents the translation along the null hypersurface. After you have this Y here, that represents the translation around the phi direction, so the rotation along the circle. And you have this W, that is times the power of R, that is uh, the weight, the vial transformation, so the um, transformation that they are perpendicular to the null hypersurfaces. And all the rest, all this sublating and all the other terms, I need it in order that these guys still belong to the same structure. So to be even more clear, they are not proper symmetry. They, they change your states. They change the point of the phase space you have started with. And as an example, and to not put a lot of formula in that, uh, in that presentation, uh, for example, the eta that I was talking to you, so this term between V and R, is, um, is transforming along this, uh, this symmetry generator in a such a way. So now we have the symmetry and we want to look about what is the algebra that the, those symmetry are. Uh, what is, what is their algebra? So usually you just compute the direct bracket of those two killing vectors, but here, as we will see later, it will be uh, the bracket that will be relevant is what we call the adjust bracket that was introduced for BMS by Barnish and Troussard. And um, so this adjust bracket is defined as you take the direct bracket of your field, and also you have to um, add this, uh, these two contribution. And so what does it mean? It means that you take your vector Xi1 and you look how it is modified by the action of Xi2. So because this guy, as you see, for example, is depending of, I don't know, on eta, it means that when you will act with this delta, it will modify this eta and that's what you need to do. And when you compute the algebra using that adjust bracket, you find the following algebra. So what is that? You see that if you just look at T, the T and Y sector, you realize that they are the, they are the diff C2, because C2, it's, uh, I mean, I call C2 the null cylinder parameterized by V and phi, because you, I mean, that's uh, those two um, um, vector. And after you have also the well transformation given by W. So that's the group we, we're having. But now, as, as you remember, I have to see which symmetry is a physical one and which of them is the pure gauge. And to answer to that question, I will need to consider the charges. So as you know, um, when you have a, a global symmetry by neutral theorem, you know that there is a conserved quantity associated to it and that it's a volume charge. But when you have a gauge symmetry, it, the Noether theorem doesn't apply directly, but you have to use the so-called generalized Noether theorem. And in this case, the gauge symmetry will be associated to uh, boundary charges. 
you can think about electromagnetism, where you have the U1 gauge symmetry, and the conserved charge associated to that is given by Gauss law when you have you have to integrate over the the sphere around your uh, around the sphere. And this boundary charge, it's a co-dimension too. So it's evaluated on the boundary at that a certain time slice. So if the charge associated to the symmetry is zero, it means that the symmetry is pure gauge because when we, you will act with it, it won't change the system, the state you have started with. While if it's charge, it means that the, the symmetry is physical or is large. So here I mean when you take the charge all over any point of the phase space. So it has to be zero for all the phase space. And as soon as it's not zero for one case, it's a large symmetry. So far so good, but we are in gravity. And in gravity, another problem is that you don't have an absolute formula for the charge. You only manage to derive a formula that is giving you the variation of the charge between a point of the phase space and uh, an infinitely close point in the phase space. So that's why I call delta Q. And it is given by the integral of the boundary. So at the boundary and at a fixed time. And uh, you have uh, this uh, curly Q and that is the formula you can derive. And um, here the H is this perturbation around a point of your phase space. So if you take that and you compute it for the phase space I was for the the the, the phase space I was uh, showing to you before, and the symmetry psi that we have computed, you find the following result. Okay, so what what is in there? So you recognize that you have this W, Y, and T, so that were the symmetry generator, and here this gamma, upsilon, and chi, and F0, omega, are depending on the metric component you started with. I have decided on purpose to not write the explicit form of this gamma, upsilon, and chi, because it was just making the formula super long, and it was not the, the point, the most important point I want to convey. So here, uh, first of all, what we can say is say that, okay, there is non-zero charge. So you have a charge associated to T, to Y and to W. So we have large gauge symmetry. But now we can ask, can we integrate the charge? And here I mean by integrate, I mean integrate over the phase space, not over the space time. So really to take off that delta. And why it is interesting in that if you, the charge are integrable, it means that this Q exists, not only is variation, and that this Q is the Hamiltonian that is associated with the flow generated by your symmetry psi you have started with. But what happens when it's not integrable? When it's not integrable, actually, it means that you have a flux through the boundary, passing through the, your boundary. And you can show that the flux is given by the non-integrable part of your charge. So, for example, here, if I assume that W doesn't depend on my of my space uh, of my point of the OL. If I, W doesn't depend on the phase space, I can integrate. I mean, I can move this delta and the charge associated to W will be W omega. But here you can see that, for example, this term here, uh, you cannot move this delta here. You cannot integrate it out. So it seems that you have a flux in that system. However, it's strange because we are in 3D gravity. I tell you that there is no propagating degrees of freedom. So why, I mean, what is this flux? What will it be? And actually one of the, the main point of this paper is that we realize that you can make the charge integrable, doing what? Doing a state dependent redefinition of your symmetry generator. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. So that's it's still the expression of the charge is if you, modify if you define a new w w hat a new y y hat and t hat by such a definition you plug back in you reorder everything and you realize that your charge can be written in this simplest in this simple form as such so here if i decide if i take this function that they are i mean t 
uh, y and w are arbitrary function of v and phi and I mean I they are arbitrary so I can decide that they are state independent, meaning that the variation over the phase space is zero. And if, I'm in, uh, if I suppose that, it means that my charge is integrable, and that is the charge. So I have an Hamiltonian given by that. And so my boundary degrees of freedom will be labeled by these charges, by omega, epsilon, and this curly uh, P. So here I have shown you that for the 3D case, I have put a structure on the boundary for which I got three uh, boundary degrees of freedom that they are arbitrary function on V and phi. So what I had announced you, I have shown you what is, I mean, that we indeed get that. But, oh yeah, so before, okay. So now we have, we had only look at the symmetry algebra of the generator, but Obviously, what matters is the symmetry algebra of the charges. And you have a result that if you have uh, an integra in a charge that is integrable, you have this representation theorem that tells you that the algebra of your charges will be given by the charge of the symmetry of your generator up to central extension. And here I put uh, that here I have to use the um, adjust bracket in order that that result will hold. If you just put the direct bracket and if your symmetry generator depends of your field, this result doesn't hold. So, okay, so if you compute that algebra for the charge that, uh, that we have found here, the algebra you found is the following. Between omega, so omega were the, the, the charge associated to a sort of W, and, uh, and the P is where the charge associated with the T that is associated to the translation along the advanced time. And here you see that they form the Heisenberg algebra. So they come in among themselves and between omega and P you have this, uh, um, this central extension. Uh, the epsilon that were associated to the rotation along the um, along the phi direction. Here you realize that this is actually the diff S1 algebra and you have some non-trivial um, um, action of uh, epsilon on this Eisenberg part of the algebra. So here I have shown you one basis where the charge were integrable, but does it exist other basis or not? And actually the answer is yes. And I want to show you another one that is very um, interesting that I will call the fundamental basis. So if I change my generator in such a way, so now I define new symmetry generator, this tilde, and uh, I introduce this curly S, I realize that my variation of the charge can be written as such. And if we go to the base where those tilde are state independent and not anymore the hat uh, w, y, and t, the charge integrable are given by that. Once again, we can compute the algebra of those charges. And what we found, we found that right now you have really a semi-direct sum between Heisenberg algebra and the diff S1. So that was one another result that we have found. And um, yes, so in general, I want to stress that here I gave you two examples, but you can do something much more general actually. So if you take your starch variation that you write like mu i delta q i, so that's the symmetry generator I was talking by, uh, talking of, and here it's all the charges. So as we have seen, if delta mu i is zero, you can integrate your charges. And um, if you define a new charge is q tilde as a, something depending on the Q and also on is derivative of the transver uh, transversal direction. So in the 3D case, it will be d phi derivative here. You can show that you will have delta Q will be the same as with some new symmetry generator mu tilde that you can compute it times delta Q tilde. 
But now the question is that is those Q tilde will form an algebra or not? Will that close or not? That you have to see and compute. And we have discussed a bit that in the paper. So I invite you to, to look at it if you want. And, but once again, I rather tell you one example because I find it that more illuminating that from this fundamental basis, so the Eisenberg direct sum with DFS1, you can generate a Vera zero algebra. So you take the fundamental basis and you go towards two current algebra and this S1. So if you define this, that will be the Q tilde in my notation of the previous slide. They are given in terms of the previous charge and their derivative, that's here. It implies some uh, transformation, I mean, some definition of this new mu tilde, those new generator. And you can see if you do the computation that the variation of the charge will be this one. Once again, you compute the algebra, you have two current algebra times uh, the DFS1. And the second step to go to Vera zero, you do this Sugavara construction where you define again new Q tilde in terms of the old Q. You have to find this um, new generator. And the charge is given by that. The algebra, you have VR0. What is very nice is that you can generate this central charge here, beta plus minus. So it depends on how you, I mean, it depends on which change of basis you are applying, but you can generate a central charge. And in the paper, you will also find that we can find um, doing such similar construction, BMS plus diff S1. And so you can see that from my fundamental algebra, I can generate, I mean, infinitely many algebra, but some of them, they are really appearing already in the literature, talking about, um, about uh, boundary condition for three-dimensional uh, uh, space-time. So now, uh, just to recap what we have done. So I give you a boundary structure such that you realize the maximal uh, number of degrees of freedom. So three function of V and phi. And I have uh, show you that if you do state dependent redefinition of your symmetry generator, we can make the charge integrable. And after I, show, I have shown you various examples of choices that lead to various symmetry algebras. So now let's go to another example to see how it works for another, uh, another setup. And here we will consider the 2D Einstein dilaton gravity. So you have uh, phi is the dilaton and R it's the um, Ricci curvature and uh, U is some potential depending on phi that is non-constant. And this theory is interesting. I mean, it has no propagating degrees of freedom, but still it has a non-trivial causal structure. It can have black holes. So once again, it makes the theory simpler, but super rich. Uh, once again, we put our null surface at r equal to zero. I choose this boundary structure here. Um, and by equation of motion, I can relate my f0 to my two other fields, eta and phi zero. So the same game, we, um, we, we find what are the symmetry generator preserving that boundary structure. And in this case, they are given in terms of two arbitrary functions, so t of v and w of v. And you have this t that represents the translation along the advanced time v, and w, the vial transformation of your surface. You can compute the algebra. I have put it here. Once again, the field, uh, the, so your, uh, your field of, um, in your theory, I mean, are, will vary under your symmetry as such. You can compute the charge. Here, uh, we have to um, include in our formula the contribution of the dilaton, and that has been done already. And so here I put you the formula, and once again, we compute it. We have this result. And here I explicitly tell you what is gamma because it was short to write. And so once again, you see that it doesn't look integrable at first sight because of that term, for example. However, once again, it is possible to find a basis of the symmetry generator for which the charge is integrable. I gave you the one here. 
if you do that plugging back, the variation of the child can be written as such. And if you impose that W hat and T hat uh, are in are constant over the phase space, the charge is given by that. So here you have two boundary gravitons and they are labeled by the value of phi zero and this curly P. So here you, are not, you have just two boundary gravitons and you can compute the algebra and that is just the Heisenberg algebra. So you already is in here in the um, fundamental basis that I was talking about. And now you can also ask the question, can I have other choices? And so if you start by the Heisenberg algebra, here I wrote it in a bit of more compact way. So QI, you have to think it that I'm counting all the charges, so phi, uh, phi zero and P, and mu I, the symmetry generator, W hat and T hat. Now the field cannot, I mean, this, this uh, change, um, change of basis can only depend on the Q and not on the derivative because you don't have the phi direction, you are in two dimensions. So it's, uh, there is no derivative in this case. And so when you compute the bracket of um, those Q tilde, you realize that it's just given by 16, 16 pi j times the determinant of the change of basis. You can show that it's already closed, so it already satisfies the Jacobi identity. And uh, if you require moreover to have a Lie algebra, it means that you can have this kind of um, left, uh, right hand side. And uh, yeah, so you can see that you have the Heisenberg is for gamma equal to one, and here you can have other options. So uh, to conclude what I have presented to you, in the two examples I have shown you, I have switched on the maximal number of boundary degrees of freedom. And as to remind you, it was the function of codimension one. And what we have shown also is that there also, uh, there exists always an integrable basis, actually more than one. Uh, so meaning that the charge can, uh, can be rendered integrable. And one of them will be this fundamental basis or when you have just Heisenberg in a direct sum with the diff S D minus two. And so that leads us to make the following proposal that whenever you have no degrees of freedom passing through the boundary, so no flux of propagating degrees of freedom, you always can find a, uh, a basis when the charge is integrable and moreover you can always find this fundamental basis so Heisenberg direct sum with div S D minus two. So here I have shown you part of the, the, the proof and the rest will be in an upcoming paper. And this project has opened a lot of questions. So we, I have shown you that we can go from one basis to another one and you can go from VR0 to BMS3, but what does it mean? When physically, what physically does it mean those bases? And uh, also when I ask, I mean, it is the way to connect what has been done in the literature because a lot of boundary conditions have already been um, shown for the cases I'm talking to from the three-dimensional Einstein gravity and for the 2D Einstein dilaton gravity. But so what does it do when you change the basis on the symmetry generator? What is the physical implication? What do they represent when you go from the basis when it looks like non-integrable uh, so yeah, that's a, a big question that we plan to tackle in the next future. And actually another point that is important is that when um, we have not considered a variation in principle, but when you do, you can add some boundary term to it because you have some ambiguities. And actually those will also determine the dynamics of your boundary degrees of freedom. Because right now the boundary condition were arbitrary function of V and the transverse direction. But you can ask what are their evolution along the boundary and that will be given by some term that you will add to the to, to your action and that will also be I mean it's also under under work right now. And that leads me to the next point where here 
I mean, I tell you that there is no flux, but still the charge are not conserved because they have an arbitrary V dependence. So it means that, I mean, if you take the DV of those charges, it won't be zero. But as soon as you will define some uh, boundary term and some dynamics, everything will go into place. And another point that is really important is that in the literature, there have been um, methods that have been uh, developed to deal when you have a non integrable charges. Uh, there is the Wal Zupas proposal, Barnish Trossard. And so we were wondering what are, I mean, in the non integrable basis that we have at the first place, what is this flux could represent? We know that it's not a physical flux, a genuine flux going through the surface, but what is it? What is the link to those methods with ours, with the change of basis? And um, finally, it can also be, and I think that can be pretty straightforward to generalize to time-like surface, uh, time-like boundaries, and uh, yes, and other, yeah, I mean, to time boundaries. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. That was a very nice talk.